All right, well, hello everybody, and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Ozark Glade Ecology and Restoration Methods with Susan Farrington. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us on this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And at the end, Kara will come back on and read those out to Susan. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any resources mentioned during the presentation. Uh, so to introduce today's speaker, Susan Farrington is a natural history biologist in the Ozarks region for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Formerly, she was a community plant ecologist with the Missouri Ozark Forest Ecosystem. She spends much of her time restoring glades and woodlands in the Ozarks, leading prescribed burns and fighting the exotic invasive species that threaten our natural communities. And just this last year, she received a Grow Native Native Plant Protector Award um, from our Grow Native program. So without further ado, take it away, Susan. All right, thank you, Brooke. Um, let's see. So she already introduced the, uh, the program, so I'm just going to dive in. What is a glade? A glade is a natural opening in the woods where the bedrock is very close to the surface. Depending on the substrate, the soil can be very rich, but its depth is relatively shallow where it, before it hits bedrock below. Although glades can be found on any aspect, they are most often found on exposed slopes facing southwest where the summer heat sears them. They are also found on the tops of bluffs and mountains. The key feature is rock outcropping and shallow soil. Although they are dominated by grasses and wildflowers, scattered trees are also a natural part of the glade community. Glade outcrops even occasionally occur within a prairie, although glades are more commonly associated with woodlands. Glades feature many of the same species of grasses and wildflowers that are found in our prairies. But being so rocky and dry, they also feature species from the desert southwest, such as prickly pear cactus. Where are glades found in Missouri? They are mostly found south of the Missouri River and are particularly common in southwest Missouri. We'll look at each of the substrate types individually. Be aware that the outlines of each of the shapes makes them appear larger than they really are. If I take away the outlines, this provides a more realistic view of glades in Missouri, though much harder to see. Total acreage is a bit over 158,000 acres, just over a third of a percent of the total land in Missouri. Looking at a generalized geologic map of Missouri, we can see the peach area is where we find dolomite glades. The bright blue area is where we see limestone glades. The red areas are where we find igneous glades and sandstone glades are interspersed in the northern section of the Ozarks. Dolomite glades are the most common type uh, in Missouri, so we'll start with them. I'll go into a lot of detail for them, but much of the information will be applicable to the other types. Then I'll cover, briefly cover the others. Dolomite glades are scattered throughout much of the Missouri Ozarks and the, Missouri, and the Ozark border country just north of the Missouri River. Dolomite is a type of magnesium rich limestone. It is, a carbonate it is a carbonate sedimentary rock consisting of double carbonates of calcium and magnesium. Because dolomite is a form of limestone, much of what I'm going to tell you about dolomite glades is also true for limestone glades. Dolomite glades feature soils that are more or less excessively well-drained and very shallow with a slightly acid to moderately alkaline soil reaction. The soil fertility is high. Dolomite breaks down into that sticky orange clay you might be familiar with if you've ever crawled around in a muddy cave. Both dolomite and limestone dissolve over time and form sinkholes, caves, natural bridges, and losing streams. This is known as karst topography. Dolomite glade soils can become saturated in winter and spring. 
But come July and August, those wet areas are typically bone dry. Plants have to be adapted to some really tough extremes to survive on a glade. Shooting star thrives in glade seeps in spring, but by midsummer, its leaves have gone completely dormant. Indian paintbrush is an annual or biennial. It blooms in seepy, are seepy areas in spring, then sets seed and dies. New seedlings emerge in summer or fall and bloom the following spring. It's also a hemiparasite deriving some of its nutrients from plants it associates with. Yellow stargrass, which is really a miniature member of the iris family, blooms early and then goes dormant, waiting out the hot, dry summer. Winter annuals like sandwort thrive in shallow soil. The plants sprout when rains saturate the soil in late fall or winter, blooming first thing in spring and then die. Deeper pockets of CP areas can feature prairie blazing star and umbrella grass. Unfortunately, CP areas are particularly vulnerable to hog rooting in the spring. Hogs are a serious threat to our glades. Whoops, sorry, went one too far. But much of a glade is dry most of the year and particularly hot and dry in July and August. A mixture of plants found in prairies, woodlands, and even southwest deserts manage to hang on in this tough environment. Fires historically would have occurred frequently in areas with expansive glades, such as the White River Hills, where Guyette and McGuinness found fire frequency to have been once every 3.2 years. In areas of isolated glades, for example, steep bluffs in the current River Hills, Fire still would have occurred during droughty years, but would have been far less frequent. Gently sloping glades were likely to have been grazed historically, and as a result, many are less species rich than their steeper counterparts. The glade on our personal property has rugged ankle twisting dolomite pinnacles. Our property was formerly a dairy farm. The farmer used barbed wire to keep the cattle off the glade, no doubt to protect his valuable livestock from injury. Other glades were not so lucky. Calcareous glades, both dolomite and limestone, share many of the same species and are some of the most species rich habitats in Missouri. Some of the key indicator species include Glade coneflower, which is very similar to pale purple coneflower, which is more commonly found in prairies. Also yellow coneflower, which has a more limited range than glade coneflower. Prairie dock, easily identified by its huge leaves, compass plant and Maximilian sunflower are all found on glades, but all three of these species could be found on prairies as well. Several milkweeds occur on glades, Butterfly milkweed blooms in June and spider milkweed blooms in May. Green milkweed is highly variable in leaf width and is more specialized to glades uh, versus other habitats. It blooms later than most other milkweeds, typically in July. Glade onion, Missouri evening primrose, bird's foot violet, and hairy wild petunia are all found on dolomite glades. Purple prairie clover is common on high quality dolomite glades. Its leaves are remarkably fragrant when rubbed between your fingers. A very rare prairie clover is Gattinger's prairie clover, which blooms earlier than purple prairie clover and is found on flat, gravelly, almost pavement-like glades. <clears throat> in Missouri, it's only known from a very small area in Howell County where these unusual glades resemble the Tennessee glades that are the heart of its distribution. Other more rare glade plants known from limited distributions in Missouri include from southwestern glades, false blue indigo, showy beard tongue, and false gara. Bush's skullcap is an Ozark endemic found only in the Missouri and, and Arkansas Ozarks and the heart of its population is centered in the current River Hills watershed where I live. And prairie iris is found scattered across the state, 
but each bloom lasts only for a few hours of a single day, so it's an easy one to miss. But one of the best glade indicators, a plant I never see unless I'm truly on some sort of calcareous glade, is Missouri Black-Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia missouriensis. If you see it on a prairie, you'll be looking at a little rocky glade outcrop within that prairie. This is a tough one to identify due to its strong resemblance to the common Black-Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia herta, which is found just about anywhere, including glades. To distinguish Missouri Black-Eyed Susan from the common, look for colonial growth, slightly smaller flower heads, strap-shaped basal leaves, and a later bloom time, August to September versus June and maybe July. Also, Rudbeckia herta tends to be um, annual, just a, a plant here and there, and then they, they can be short-lived perennials but not live very long. Missouri Black-Eyed Susan is definitely a colonial perennial. In addition to these wildflowers, warm season grasses are found in abundance, including little blue stem, big blue stem, and Indian grass. Also, side oats grama, rough drought seed, and switchgrass. These are only some of the grasses that you'll find on glades. Woody species found on dolomite glades include chinkapin oak and post oak, gum bumelia and dwarf hackberry, and dogwoods and redbuds, both of which are less fire tolerant than the above species and can become overly abundant in the absence of fire. We'll talk about eastern red cedar later. Moving on to limestone glades. They generally occur on relatively steep slopes above large streams or rivers. They're found on the northern and western edges of the Missouri Ozarks. They're very similar to dolomite glades in their soil characteristics and depth of soil. You can see members of the native, Missouri Native Plant Society here examining the layers of limestone. Rocky Point glades are being restored by volunteer efforts led by Kansas City Wildlands. And the result is a great place to hike and explore within the Kansas City metro area. Many of the same species found on dolomite glades are also found on limestone glades. But a few specialists are found on limestone, including the prairie dandelion, a species of conservation concern which is also found on Lus prairies in Northwest Missouri. And the federally threatened Missouri bladder pot. Igneous glades feature rock that was created by the cooling and solidification of magma from volcanoes many years ago. Missouri's igneous glades are comprised of rhyolite, granite, or mudlick delonite. That was a new one to me. I had not heard of delonite. Rhyolite's common where I live. Uh, granite is over by the shut in, um, Johnson shut-ins or elephant rocks area. Elephant rocks are made out of granite. And granite and rhyolite are very similar to one another. They're, the difference is in their molecular structure. Granite is easy to work. Rhyolite is not. And so nobody has a rhyolite countertop. Unlike sedimentary rock, which dissolves over time, these rocks are highly resistant to weathering. Igneous rocks, rock is mostly deeply buried in Missouri, but it is found on the surface in the St. Francis Mountain and also in a small area of Carter and Shannon counties. Like dolomite and limestone glades, igneous glades feature soils that are shallow, droughty in the summer and fall, and can be seasonally saturated in winter and spring. <clears throat> Basins in the rock often hold water through the winter and spring. But the soil fertility is low with a strong acid to moderately acid soil reaction. Given that igneous glades tend to occur on some of the highest landscapes in Missouri, lightning strikes are common and dendrochronology studies have found that fire historically occurred at least every three years. 
Trees and shrubs on igneous glades often grow in bedrock fractures and include black jack oak, host oak, shortleaf pine, black hickory, and service berry. The, herba the herbaceous plant community tends to be less rich than for calcareous glades. Prominent species include wild hyacinth, tixseed coreopsis, wild onion, and brown headed bush clover, dwarf dandelion, downy phlox, and Ohio spiderwort. In deeper soil on a few igneous glades in the St. Francis Mountains, the federally endangered Meads milkweed thrives. And in the shallowest soil, soil areas, we find rush foil, rough buttonweed, pineweed, thread-leafed sundrops, and large-flowered faneflower. Like other glades, igneous glades are unfortunately vulnerable to hog damage. Here you can see they were rooting for wild onions, one of their favorites. Sandstone glades in Missouri are found on moderate to steep slopes and can occur on all aspects but like the other glades are predominantly south and west facing. Our sandstone glades are generally small and are located in a broad arc extending north around the Ozark Dome. Soils are shallow and they have a very strongly acid to moderately acid soil reaction. Soil fertility is low. Woody species include post oak, blackjack oak, winged elm, and farkleberry. Characteristic plants include pinweed, golden selenia, thread-leafed sundrops, and mealy corydalis. A very rare specialist is the federally threatened geocarpum or tiny tin. Note the penny in that photo to see just how tiny that plant is. Chert glades are the rarest of all glades in Missouri. They occur on ridges, slopes, and valleys along streams. Slopes are very gently sloping, or yeah, to strongly sloping on all aspects. Soils are very shallow to shallow with a strongly to strong, a very strongly to strongly acid reaction. Soil fertility is very low. Chert glades are located only in a small area of Newton County and also in Berry County. The majority of our chert glades occur within the city limits of Joplin, and thus development and trash dumping are serious threats to them. Only wildcat glades is in protected public ownership. All other chert glades in Missouri are privately owned. Trees and shrubs on chert glades include blackjack oak, post oak, winged sumac, winged elm, dwarf hackberry, and lowbush blueberry. Dominant plants include Little blue stem, wild hyacinth, scaly blazing star, wild petunia, uh, Samson snake root, and round headed bush clover. In shallower areas, you can find eastern prickly pear, rush foil, small flowered fame flower, dwarf dandelion, and widow's cross. Characteristic plants include golden selenia and shining blue star. All glades are great habitats for a wide variety of wildlife. Here you might be able to see a cottontail blending into a winter glade scene. And we all know that deer and turkey like to eat acorns in the woods, but a Missouri study found that very little of a turkey's diet was acorns in October when acorns are easy pickings. So what are turkeys eating instead of acorns in October? Bugs, and especially grasshoppers. Where is a turkey going to find a lot of bugs? On a glade or adjacent open woodland that has an abundance of grasses, wildflowers, and therefore lots of grasshoppers, beetles, etc. Glades also provide high grass within which a doe can easily hide her fawn. This person's finger is pointing at a crevice in the dolomite rock, which is the hiding place for a critter you probably don't associate with glades. Eastern small-footed bats love to spend their summers hiding in rock crevices on glades. 
plenty of reptiles like all types of glades, including prairie race runners, which are far more likely to be found on a rocky open glade than in a prairie, prairie lizards, formerly fence lizards, which again are more likely to be found on rocky glades and open woodlands than in prairies, eastern collared lizards, known affectionately by some as mountain boomers, although they don't make any noise. I have seen them run on their hind two legs and they are speed demons. Glades are home to numerous species of snakes, including the diminutive prairie ringneck snake, which does live in prairies in addition to glades. Another tiny snake is the decay's brown snake, which I've always called a midland brown snake, but apparently that subspecies is no longer recognized. <coughs> Speckled king snakes are kings of the glade and many other habitats as well. They're typically three to four feet in length and, and constrict their prey, which is anything they can catch, such as mice or birds or lizards or even venomous snakes. All king snakes are immune to the venom of Missouri's pit vipers. So a king snake is a great snake to have around your house. The Eastern milk snake is one of Missouri's prettiest snakes and unlike the similar, the somewhat similar looking coral snake, which is not found in Missouri, the milk snake is not venomous. Eastern yellow-bellied racers can flee at top speeds. Locally, many Missourians call them blue racers for the blue highlights on their sides. The Western pygmy rattlesnake is found on many rocky glades in Southern Missouri. Pygmies don't get anywhere near as big as timber rattlesnakes. They are usually 15 to 22 inches long. They are secretive and seldom bite. Their rattle is very soft sounding, sounding mostly like an insect and could easily be missed. Striped black scorpions are also found on our glades. They hide under rocks by day, but if you want to find one without lifting up rocks, simply take a UV flashlight onto a glade at night when they are on the move and they glow. Scorpions bear young, live young called scorplings that ride on mom's back for 10 to 20 days until their exoskeleton hardens. <clears throat> the Texas brown tarantula makes its home on our glades, especially in southwestern Missouri, but they can be found in eastern and central Missouri glades as well. Females live many decades. Males reach sexual maturity around five years old and go looking for love in the autumn. After their vast wander wanderings and hopefully successful mating, they die of exhaustion. A quick reminder of glade protocol. If you lift a rock, be certain that you are prepared for anything under it, including a rattlesnake, and don't drop that rock on top of the critter. It's your responsibility to move it out from under the rock if needed so that you can place the rock back exactly as you found it without hurting what is under it. Unscrupulous herpers do a lot of damage to our glades, flipping rocks and stealing animals. Please protect our glades and the animals on them and leave them be. Glades also provide an abundance of floral choices for pollinators, both common and specialized. Butterflies abound on glades. They especially love blazing star. Spider milkweed provides nectar for a red banded hair streak. This monarch caterpillar has left its milkweed to find a place to pupate. And adult monarchs can be seen feeding on glade coneflowers in early June. Another increasingly rare butterfly is the Ozark checker spot. The caterpillar feeds on false foxglove species in the adjacent woodlands. Its beautiful chrysalis can be found hanging on a glade. And it's even more beautiful adult form emerges in late May, just in time to feed on glade coneflowers. Bumblebees are becoming increasingly less common but managed glades are a great place to help support them. Beetles are the most numerous group in the insect world and many are found on glades. Although this hoverfly is called the maize calligrapher for its association with corn, 
I assure you this one on our was this one on our glade was nowhere near any corn. Glades are great songbird, songbird habitat, particularly for grassland birds like the field sparrow, once considered a common bird, but it is in steep decline in recent years. Managing glades for open grassy habitat is a big boon for them. And for greater road runners, particularly in the southwestern part of our state, although this one, although they've been known to roam quite widely throughout the state. This one was running along a roadside, but it wasn't far from glades. Summer tanagers can often be heard singing on glades. And brown thrashers enjoy the shrubby habitat surrounding many glades. In Missouri, glade edges are preferred habitat for painted buntings. They experienced a national population decline of 3% annually from 1966 to 2000. A 3% decline doesn't sound like much, but in 35 years, a 2% decline can cut a population in half. Prairie warblers are another misnamed species, typically found on glades rather than prairies. Prairie warblers have declined over 70% since 1966. They like the, the low shrubby edges of glades that are managed with fire. They also like a clear cut, but only for a few years post-harvest. A managed glade can provide them with excellent habitat for the long haul. Dr. Frank Thompson and colleagues also found that in the Ozark Highlands, prairie warblers were 27 times more abundant in managed habitat than unmanaged habitat. Chapman's research in Oklahoma showed that when cedar covered 28% of former grasslands, shrub birds completely replaced grassland birds. Grassland birds are in serious trouble and anything we can do for glade restoration to provide more habitat for grassland birds is crucially needed. So what's the deal with cedars? Native Eastern red cedar thrives on rocky soils and thanks to an average of 45 to 48 inches of rain each year, cedars can smother an Ozark glade in just a few decades. Everything that you see in dark purple is glade habitat that was lost to cedar and other tree species by 1993. Overall, about 60% of the glade area had been lost relative to 1956, with all glades being reduced in size and some glades disappearing entirely. It wasn't always the case that cedars were everywhere. When land surveyors traveled Missouri in the early 1800s, they marked witness trees along survey lines, noting the species. The dark points are cedar witness trees from the 1820s and the pink areas are glades. You might think that the cedars are mostly on the glades. Until you add the major rivers to the map, you can see that the cedars mostly follow the rivers where they have lived for many centuries on our steep river bluffs that can't be reached by fire. But if you look at the cluster in southwestern Missouri, where there are so many glades, you might think the cedars were more, much more prevalent there. So this is that area zoomed in. And yes, there were more cedars uh, there than, than other places, but you can tell that most of the glades have little or no cedars appearing on them. And most of the cedars are following rivers and drainages. Some of the cedars on our bluffs don't look very big, but can be hundreds of years old, even up to a thousand years. How old do you think these massive cedars on a glade at Peck Ranch are? Most people would assume at least 100 or 200 years old. They're really, really tall. But we counted the rings on the stumps and found them to be approximately 75 years old, dating to the 1940s, when fire suppression likely began at Peck Ranch. Whereas this much smaller cedar clinging to the edge of a bluff is likely to be at least three to 500 years old. Both the absence of fire and the disturbed conditions created by the heavy harvest of timber in the early 1900s followed by overgrazing of livestock 
have contributed to the spread of eastern red cedars all over the landscape, but particularly across our glades. But the coolest thing about glades is that you can truly, you truly can restore them. Often the places, often the pieces are still there. So unlike a plowed prairie where you have to start from scratch, a glade just needs to have the cedars removed. There are usually remnant plants and seeds just waiting for something bad to happen to those cedars so that they can find the sun again. This was our glade before we removed the cedars. Note the chinkapin oak hiding behind, behind all those cedars. After cedar removal and four prescribed burns, this is that same chinkapin oak. We didn't plant any seeds whatsoever on our glade. It's just amazing what's out there waiting to be found. Small cedars are easily killed by fire, but larger cedars only lose their lower limbs to fire. If all the needles on a cedar are consumed, it is dead. But if just one branch is not burned, it lives on. So fire by itself will not get rid of these things. So if we want to save an overgrown blade, we have to cut the cedars down. The good news is that the stumps do not resprout, so herbicide is not needed. But once all that cedar is on the ground, it will smother the wildflowers and grasses trying to emerge. And if we run a prescribed fire through such a heavy load of cedar slash, we can cause the death or injury of the 200 year old oaks with widespreading limbs that would characterize the open woodlands surrounding our glades. Hotter is not always better. Here is a glade that was slashed and burned with no attempt to mitigate the heavy fuel loading before prescribed fire was applied. You can see most of the trees are dead and the rock is cracked and turned white from the heat. This is another glade that was burned with a very heavy fuel loading. <clears throat> Weedier plants will rule at first after such a major disturbance and most of the trees are dead. It's amazing how long cedar can stay on the ground. This cedar was cut at least 20 years ago and has seen at least five prescribed burns. The fine branches and needles burned off during the first burnt fire, but the larger branches and trunk have persisted. Since it's one lonely skeleton in a very open glade, it's not a problem. But imagine your glade covered with these skeletons for at least 20 years. So you need a plan as to what to do with all that cedar if you decide to cut it. One option is to sell the logs. This is a lot of work. You have to cut them to the proper length and trim a heck of a lot of branches off each log. But there's a good market for cedar logs if you are willing to go to the effort. If you can pile up enough logs, a cedar buyer will send out a tractor trailer for you to load. And my husband did this about four or five times when we restored our glades. We quickly learned that the four foot logs were a lot easier to deal with than the eight foot logs, but you can sell a four foot log, six inches on the small end for a reasonable price. Get, get some return on your hard work. But even if you sell the logs, there will be a lot of volatile cedar slash left behind. And one way to deal with this is to pile and burn it during the winter. No day is too cold to burn cedars, but be sure the ground is saturated and or covered in snow when you burn. You don't want to start a wildfire doing this. And if you don't have a good way to sell or use the logs, they can be burned as well. Another option is to have the cedar slash hauled off the glade to one gigantic pile in an old field or on a ridge top and burn it when snow is on the ground. But be very careful with this option as it will create 40 foot flame lengths. Choose your burn pile locations carefully as the intense heat of even a small cedar pile will sterilize the soil within the footprint of the fire and any plants will be killed. Any rocks under it will crack and turn white. I don't like to put burn piles on any ledge rocks that might be harboring hibernating snakes and I keep them away from good oaks and other trees I want to save. Putting them on top of a big cedar stump is perfect because not much else was likely to be growing under a big cedar. 
The burn piles areas will, will recover, but it does take time. Only a few weedy annuals will grow in the heart of the pile the first year, but rose ver verbena seems to love to colonize the edges of these burn piles in the first year or two after, a after you burn them. Another method to deal with fuel loading on the ground is to double girdle a cedar trunk, which is supposed to kill the cedar without dropping it on the ground. This sounds like a great idea, letting sunshine in without having to deal with the dead carcass on the ground. But too often I've seen that the cuts are too shallow so that the cedar lives on, or just a little too deep, causing the cedar to break off in a windstorm and create an even bigger mess when it falls uncontrolled. I'm not really a fan of this practice because I think it's very hard to get it just right. One alternative to that is to double girdling is to try the hack and squirt method. Hack into the cambium layer and apply an appropriate herbicide to the cut. This leaves most of the wood intact to keep the tree standing. I've only used this a couple times, but it seemed to work reasonably well. Once we've removed the cedars, we can't just call it done and walk away because it only takes about 10 years for cedars to get this big and start to take over a glade once again. Prescribed fire will take out those young cedars. Without it, we are doomed to keep cutting and cutting and cutting. Fire is not just important to keep cedars at bay. Yellow coneflower plants were equally abundant on both sides of this fire line that separates the two sides of this fire managed glade. The right half was last burned four and a half years before this photo was taken. The left half was burned the fall before the photo. Ash is a natural fertilizer. Thanks to the nutrient cycling of fire, plants become more nutritious, nutritious, bloom more and produce more seeds. Fire is an awesome tool, but it is also an awesome responsibility. Fire is extremely variable and it takes a lot of practice and understanding to apply it safely and effectively. You need to know what you're doing to safely burn. A good start is to attend a burn workshop provided by MDC. Try to help out with a burn before attempting your own. Enlist the help of experienced folks to assist you in your first burn and choose the right and safest conditions. My husband and I typically burn between December and February when conditions are typically milder. We ignite a couple hours before dark when the humidity is coming up. The fire often continues into the evening, lighting up the sky, and eventually the humidity rises enough to put it out. If we need to do any interior burning afterwards, we have plenty of burned area to prevent it from get getting out. You can always go back and burn something a little hotter if need be, but you can't unburn something that was burned too hot. One more point about restoration and burning. Folks are often upset that too many sprouts come up in their woodlands or glades a year or two after burning. My husband was disappointed in how brushy the Stiegel Mountain igneous glades remained despite repeated prescribed burns until he read the land survey notes. The survey line that crossed the dome of Stiegel Mountain said it was thickly set with hickory, oak, and blackjack bushes, even back in 19, 1821. Those same bushes, or maybe not the exact same ones, but those same species keep resprouting, re and I can only guess just how old some of their root systems are. Remember that prairie warblers and other birds enjoy shrubby habitat along the edges of glades. As long as we keep fire in the system, those sprouts will burn down and re-sprout repeatedly. So how do you know if you have a glade? Look for rocky outcrops and cedars covering them. Learn to identify some of the key glade indicator species and look for them struggling to survive in the shade. This is Missouri black-eyed Susan in an overgrown glade. And these are the leaves of glade coneflower. It takes some detective work to recognize these plants vegetatively in the shade. An easier way might be to use this cool tool online. The glade layer I showed you earlier 
was created by Paul Nelson and it is available for you to use. The easiest way to find it online is to type Natural Glades in Missouri, in Missouri and Arkansas into Google and it will, it will be your first link. MPF will also make this link available to you. Once it opens, you can click on Open in Map and zoom into your property and see whether he shows any glades there. You can turn on the aerial photography lady, layer and zoom in. Here it's showing a glade and it tells what type it is and how big it is. It isn't always perfect, of course. It misses a few and once in a while is wrong about something being a glade. But this layer is surprisingly accurate and very helpful. So get out there and explore a glade. Better yet, restore one. Thanks. I think we're ready for questions. I got done a little quicker than I expected. Susan, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, this is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we do have some questions that I'm going to um, uh, read out to Susan. If you have uh, questions, please do put them in the Q&A and we'll answer as many of them as we can. Um, Susan, when you were talking about uh, using fire, if, you're if you know you have a glade and you're restoring it, using fire as a tool, how often should you use fire in the restoration phase and then sort of the maintenance phase? Sure. Uh, my husband and I choose to do it every couple of years. We missed one year, so it, that particular time we went three, but we've been doing our burn every couple of years. In reality, in the public land system, we don't, we don't have the resources to burn every couple of years. So in our public glades, we do our best to try to burn every three years uh, in the restoration phase. It, once we get to a maintenance phase, going every four or five seems to be okay, but you don't wanna go much further out than that. And particularly since it's not very common that we're only burning a glade, we're usually burning an associated open woodlands surrounding that glade. And if we go too long with not burning that woodland, you get those sprouts will no longer be killed by fire. Having sprouts come up and then get, you know, burned back down is fine. But if they get past the point where they can get burned back down, you can get very, you can get it a lot more um, covered with trees again. And that's a good point, Susan. I know a number of years ago, Dr. Alan Templeton at Washington University was working on a study looking at collared lizards and their genetics on Ozark glades and found that where areas where the woodlands between glades were not being burned, the, the collared lizards couldn't move from glade to glade, um, but where they were burned, the populations were healthier, which is just another aspect of managing the whole area. Um, which is something I should have included in this talk, but I ran out of time to include it. <laughs> I didn't realize I would have time to spare. Oh, no, that's okay. That's we. There's but one thing I'd like to say about that study, because I didn't get a chance to cover it. It is really interesting. The, 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 um, the collared lizards that were released on glades on Steagall Mountain wouldn't move from one glade to another until they burned the inter intervening woodlands between the glades. And that's because there was no, there was no food for them to follow. There were no grasshoppers in that overgrown woodland. There was no heat for them in those shady dark woodlands. They couldn't see through the woodlands and see the other glades. So burning the entire landscape is very important. You can't just circle around a glade and call it restoration. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here from Andrea. What is your preferred herbicide? Um, of course, I know you use different ones for different things, but could you talk a little bit about um, herbicides that you use for glade restoration and management? Well, like I said, normally you don't need any herbicide to kill cedars. You just need to cut them down. And, um, and as far as if, if I'm killing exotic invasives, it depends on the exotic invasive what, what uh, herbicide I'm going to choose. That one reference I made to hacking and squirting cedar trees, which uh, would require some herbicide, the, the only time I've done that we were doing it actually within the MOFEP study and they only allowed us to use Roundup for glyphosate. So we used, I believe, a 50% solution in a squirt bottle and squirted it into the, the cuts we made on those cedars. And, um, 
and that did work reasonably well. I, um, I think also you could use any product with triclopyr, which is a um, fairly fairly uh, safer, there's no such thing as a safe herbicide, but safer herbicide to use. And that's the one that we typically choose to use in natural areas because it doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of flashback in going to other trees that, you, that, that are unintended targets. So either glyphosate or triclopyr for most of the woodies that I deal with. Thank you. And we can include a link um, in the email that Brooke will send out tomorrow. Um, we can send a link to a table that the um, Jared Hubner with the uh, Prairie Foundation put together um, that lists herbicides to use for what, what kind of plants, and that could be helpful. But as Susan said, for Eastern Red Cedar, normally you don't have to use herbicide. Uh, as long Only as if you're hacking and squirting. Yes. Um, have you, Stephen asks, have you seen any issues with Carolina buckthorn overtaking glades? And of course, Carolina buckthorn is native, um, but uh, what's your observations on, on sure. that? It it definitely will take over, especially in um, glade. I see it more in the narrow, bland, uh, narrow band of glades along uh, the rivers. Like in the current river hills, we have some real steep and narrow glades, and they tend to be taken over by uh, buckthorn, red buds, dogwood, all native species, all belong there, but they're overly abundant on a glade. And they can just as easily shade it out as a cedar can, which is also native. Um, Fire, however, will keep them in check. Uh, the, if you keep fire in, to, in a regular system in there, you're not going to be overrun with them. Um, in the short term, I guess some people might choose to cut and treat some of them just to get a jump start on the restoration pro process. I wouldn't get rid of all of them because they're all valuable species, um, but, uh, but they can be overabundant and you don't want them to shade out a glade. Thank you. We have a number of questions about um, potential damage to land and wildlife in, during glade restoration. Um, Jean asks, is there a loss of wildlife during, the, during these burns because the area of burn is so restricted and animals cannot move? Um, well, animals can move. If you're burning in December through February, some of the more vulnerable animals are underground, like snakes or like box turtles. They're not going to be affected. They're underground and fire does not penetrate. If you're doing it right, fire doesn't penetrate into the ground hardly at all. So they would be fine. Um, and, and things like um, red bats will overwinter in leaf litter and you would think would be very vulnerable. They've been studied. They actually arouse when they, when they hear the flames, when they smell the smoke. And they get, and I've seen it when I've been out burning, I've seen red, red bats fly up and away from us. Um, so I know that they can escape. Um, you know, things like cottontails are quick, deer are quick, birds can fly off. So a lot of animals will, very few animals would be killed by a typical Ozark fire. Um, people might not, now granted, when you're burning tall, warm season grass, that's a very fast moving fire. When you're burning a woodland and even most glades, depending on how high the grass is, the fire is a lot slower, especially in the woodlands. In the woodlands, there's tons of opportunity to move ahead of the flame length and to get out of it. You can even cross it easily. So I, I think that as long as you're careful in choosing when and how you burn and under what conditions you burn, you're, you're going to harm very little wildlife and create really good wildlife habitat. Thank you. Carolyn asks, will a fire wipe out the lichens and mosses on a very rocky outcrop? If it's very rocky, the fire that, then there's probably very little fuel. So the fire will mostly miss that spot and therefore the lichens and mosses should be okay. If you're talking about um, an area that was formerly covered by cedar and the ground is covered with moss because it had been completely dense shade, that moss probably will be lost. But I think on rock outcrops, most of the lichens and mosses have adapted and been there for a long time when fires have come through. Thank you. And I think it's important to, to remember too that to perpetuate 
the glade dependent species, fire is critically important. And so without fire, many more species will suffer or their populations can't be sustained or enhanced without fire. Right. Um, it, Lee asks, and I think, I think you may have answered this, but Lee asks, is there a downside vegetatively to too frequently burning, like annually? Um, annual burning, I have we haven't I haven't done that much in the way of annual burning, but I've visited places that have been burned annually and vegetatively they can be very rich. So most of the herbaceous species are going to respond reasonably well to that, depending on the time of year and when they're burning. And if you always burn at exactly the same time of year and it's pushing into the growing season, then sure, you could do damage, especially trying to burn every year. But the other important thing to remember about annual burning is that if you do burn every year, there's not a very heavy fuel loading and you end up with a much milder burn because there just isn't a buildup of thatch, litter, et cetera, and the, the, it's going to be patchier by, by, by nature. And patchy burns in general are good. That's what we always strive for. We don't, I don't think 100% uh, black is a successful burn. A successful burn is 75% black maybe, and lots of pockets where there's some refugia for the few things that might not benefit from fire. Thank you. A couple of other uh, questions about burning. Um, Mary says, when you do your evening night burns, do you find that they have more mosaic of unburned patches versus daytime burns in glades? Oh. Guessing the answer is yes. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Yeah, and we choose to burn, we, we don't burn just at, in the evening, so to speak. We start in the later afternoon, but it goes into the evening and sometimes all the way overnight, depending on conditions. And it's definitely patchy and that's what we want. So we're happy if it's patchy, but reasonably good coverage. Thanks. Um, Pete uh, says the burn frequency issue seems interesting. I'm no entomologist, but some insect specialists uh, may be concerned when burning is too frequent since it appears to reduce certain insect populations and overall diversity. But what are your thoughts, Susan? Well, and there, that's a huge unknown. I mean, I am no, I'm not an entomologist, I'm not an expert, and even the entomologists don't seem to have all the answers to those questions yet. And there's so many different insects that it's impossible for anybody to know the effect on all of them. So that's why I think it's really important that we have those refugia that I just mentioned. If we don't burn an entire habitat, if we leave some areas unburned, then there's gonna be some refugia for those insects to survive and then to recolonize. Um, I know studies in prairies with regal fritillaries, you know, we, we worry about damaging the um, regal fritillaries when we burn, but as soon as a, an area is burned, they flock to that area. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have mosaic and a, a mosaic that allows species to continue, but then those species will typically then go to the recently burned habitat. Thank you, Susan. I think it's also important to think about what species of insects are we talking about? Because there could be generalist species that might may or may not be harmed, but we know that there are specialist species like the lichen grasshoppers that are occurring pretty much only on glades and they will not survive or do well if the glade habitat becomes too closed in. So I think it's really important to be thinking about um, specialist species versus generalists as well. Right, one really interesting thing that came out of that uh, collared lizard study by Alan Temp Templeton was that the grasshoppers, um, before they started burning all the woodlands and before the glades were receiving much fire and before they put the collared lizards back in there, there was one kind of big general generalist grasshopper. When they reintroduced the um, collared lizards and started burning, the collared lizards hammered that general, that general grasshopper and the specialist grasshoppers started to increase. And so grasshopper species diversity increased with management and with the introduction of the lizards. Thank you. There's several questions about cedars. And I think you might have answered this, but I know there's a lot of information, so it might be helpful if you could um, go over it a little bit more. Scott asks, are dead cedars on the ground after slashing 
or standing live cedars better or worse for ground flora and fauna? Right. Um, an occasional cedar on the ground isn't going to do any harm, but like I said earlier in the, in the program, if you have a bunch of cedar laying on the ground, it is going to take absolute decades to disappear. And in the meantime, uh, vines and other things will grow on top of them, creating an awful lot of shade and an impediment to both plants growing and animals moving across that glade. So it's pretty important to get as much of the cedar off of the glade as you can. And that's why if we can kill them and leave them standing where they don't fall over, then that can let in the sunshine and be fine um, and provide good purchase for birds and such. But when they end up tipped over all over the glade, that, that is definitely an impediment to, to the restoration of that glade. Something that we do with the Prairie Foundation, if we have, if we're restoring an, an, an original prairie, there might be some trees on it. But then if there might be some things like Japanese honeysuckle under it, we treat the, we, we girdle the trees, treat the honeysuckle underneath it before felling. Because if you, if you fell the tree before you treat the invasives underneath it, then that's really difficult. Um, there's a question here, can cedar limbs be spread out and burnt without burning too hot? Yeah, um, that is, a, and I forgot to cover that, and I should have. That is yet another approach to dealing with fuel loading, is cutting the cedar. You know, when you drop a cedar tree, it's got big, fat, wide branches that stick out in all directions, and the thing is, you know, six feet tall on the ground, sticking up with all its branches. If you can limb those cedar, those, you cut all those limbs off, create just a log, heck, the log laying there isn't going to and isn't going to create a real problem and um, you know will provide some place for lizards to run on top of. Um, and if that slash can be cut very close to the ground and scattered preferably in the edges of the woods and not on the glade itself, then yeah, the stuff can can melt down. That cedar slash can melt down and the, um, the, the, the logs will not melt down. They'll be there for quite a long time, but the, the slash can melt down. And if you can do it in such a way, if you can do it in small stages, peel it off in stages and create some slash and then spread it out and pull it away from the keeper trees that you want to make sure you protect, then you can run a prescribed fire through there if it's not in a really heavy fuel loading and that can get rid of your slash. But that's a continual process. You'd want to do it in layers and you'd want to spread out that, that slash and make sure it gets as close to the ground as possible. And uh, the only, you know, and try to get all the limbs off the big logs. Thank you. Edith has a good question. Don't you need to be concerned about soil damage from machinery when harvesting cedar logs? How do you handle this? So yes, absolutely. Some people have really flat glades and if you can do that, if you could actually bring in equipment um, if it was um, in the right time of year. Uh, surprisingly, that might be August because it's so dry on a glade. When we bought our property, we bought it from loggers that were busily logging it. Um, so they did a pretty hard cut on most of our property and they started to cut on the glade, but they quickly changed their minds when they saw those dolomite pinnacles because that would tear up their very expensive skitter um, tires. So they stayed off the glade entirely, but they did go up um, one main kind of road, ridge top road that goes across the glade. And we call that log landing because that was their log landing. Uh, we call it uh, glade coneflower landing, I'm sorry, because it was their log landing. And the coneflowers erupted in bloom the year or two after they finished, you know, roughing up that spot back and forth with all their equipment. I'm sure they did do some damage to the soil there, but the, the plants for the most part handled it fine. Um, the rest of our glade, we didn't use any heavy equipment. When, um, when Dan, cut, Dan cut all the cedars himself with a chainsaw, we got the glade, the cedar, the cedar logs off the glade with a few different methods. One was we rigged up, um, we put it on our um, bracks, brackets on our ATV. We had a very, we had that small tractor you saw in the photo. And in some areas, Dan did bring the tractor in and created kind of a log carrying attachment to get the bigger logs off glades. 
And we hand carried a heck of a lot of those logs off of those glades as well. So yes, um, equipment is challenging. Um, also, I remember Dan did a contract on one of the Angeline glades where he had a contractor come in and remove the cedar using a cable skitter. The skitter stays at the top and the cable goes down and pulls the cedar off of the glade. Thank you. There's a number of questions here about how to get um, landowner assistance and, and I'll get to those in a moment. But before then, a lot of people may not own glades but would like to visit glades. And Damon has a really good question. When visiting glades without trails, are there precautions to take to preserve any sensitive vegetation? And I'll also add sensitive animals. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Glades almost—they—it's rare for you to have a um, trail through a glade. One I can think of is a Caney Mountain. That's a there's a nice glade, that, a nice trail there through the um, the Long Bald Glade. That's very nice. But mostly you are just walking through a glade and. Generally, I don't worry that much about it because most of, if you're just walking a few people and, and here and there, um, you're not likely to, to do a lot of damage. Now, it might be different if you're right near a city and lots and lots of people are visiting that glade, then there may be some overuse there. But um, just watching where you put your feet, both for your own safety, as far as you don't wanna step on a snake um, and for the safety of the plants, we oftentimes tease people when they come to visit our glade in um, September when the, the rough blazing star is in bloom. We literally have tens of thousands of the stems blooming. And we look at them as we walk into the glade and we're like, well, don't step on any. And they look at us terrified. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. If you step on a plant here or two, it's going to be fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'd also like to add, of course, um, most glades have the rocky outcrops and, and loose and, 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 ro and rocks on top of bedrock, it can be very tempting to want to look under those rocks or move them. But just remember that those rocks are critically important habitat for um, many creatures, including the bats and reptiles that Susan mentioned. And so it's really important to leave them in place. Um, reptiles need to sun themselves and then get in the shade, changing their temperature as much as 30 degrees in a day. And so those microhabitats are critically important. Absolutely, and, and watch your step on some of those because if, if uh, you step on a loose uh, ledge rock, you may smash whatever's underneath there. Um, Amy asks, when is the best time to see flowers blooming on the various types of glades? Right, that's going to vary, but in general, I'd say there's a, there's a spring, early summer peak and then there's a uh, fall peak. Most glades, as we talked about, was in July and August are so hot. There are things blooming on glades in July and August, especially if it's not a real bad drought year. If it's really droughty, there's nothing blooming on a glade in July and early August. Um, but our, at least our glade, the peak is the end of May um, for when the coneflowers are blooming. And then again, in the beginning or middle of um, September when the blazing stars are blooming. But there's beautiful things to see as from anywhere from April all the way into mid-June at least or later June and then again depending on the year and how much moisture you have anywhere from July or August but definitely September and all the way into October. There's beautiful asters that the uh, aromatic aster is still blooming in mid to late October on a glade. Thank you, Susan. And there are a number of glades in urban or in or near urban areas, and we'll send some links to those. Um, there's a, um, um, Valley the Wildcat, View glades. Wild, Valley, Valley View and, and Victoria glades uh, south of St. Louis. There's um, Wildcat glade, Chert glade in Joplin. Um, near Camdenton is a wonderful trail through glade at Haha ha Tonka State Park. Um, uh, Brett has a really good question. What plant species found in glades could have potential for use in the hot, dry, and poor soil conditions that can be found in some urban landscapes? Hmm. Um, well, what about rock pink, which makes a really good uh, 
um, potted plant in the summertime because it's so resistant to dry. I mean, it's so tolerant of drying out. So the fame flower or rock pink, the femoranthus is the current name. The old name was Tolinum. Um, it's a little succulent that's very sweet, very small, and could probably grow out of the crack in a pavement uh, in the middle of the city, I would think, as long as it got sunshine. Um, and let's see, what else would be really tolerant? I mean, obviously prickly pear cactus, but I don't recommend that one. It's a pain in the neck. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I don't know, most, many of the other species would do okay, but it's funny, some of their drought tolerance, like the Missouri Black-Eyed Susan lives in this very dry environment and yet is, doesn't seem to be very drought tolerant in that when it, when it is really dry, it just wilts and looks like crud. And then when the rains come, suddenly it perks up and it's happy and everything's fine again. So, so that might not look very good when it was in its drier conditions. Um, we have a um, rock garden, a grow native rock garden template that um, in, uh, incorporates some plants from glades. And we'll send a link to that uh, tomorrow and that might be helpful. Um, if you're lucky enough to have some some rocky area, uh, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have a glade, that's wonderful. Oh, but if you're if you don't have a glade um, and you happen to have rock, I I happen to have a stretch along my house where, where rock was just dumped, and I and I kind of made that a glade garden. But you can also bring rock in. Um, but we'll share that tomorrow. Um, there are a number of questions here about for people landowners looking for help either identifying glades. Um, technical advice and or federal or state cost share programs to help with costs of prescribed burning or cedar removal or invasive exotic plant control. Um, Susan, can you speak about that, about if there is help available? Certainly. Um, there sure is. It's not in my Ballywick. I don't work in private lands, but we have a whole private lands division and the private lands conservationist, every county has a private lands conservationist. If you call your local regional um, MDC office and ask who is your private lands conservationist, you can also find that online on the MDC website. And it's, there's somewhere on there, there's a find your local contacts and put your county in and it will tell you who your private land conservationist is. So that's a good start. Oftentimes, um, they will consult with us natural history biologists, and if they've got an interesting pro property, they'll ask us to come along to the, the private land uh, visit, and which we often do. Um, so we're happy to help as well, but we can't, we can't visit every piece of property, unfortunately. Um, it's just we've got too much other things to do besides that. But the PLCs can help you, and there are a lot of different cost share programs. Glades are definitely one of those things that, one of those natural communities that are stressed, and they make great pollinator habitat, and that's the big stress these days, too. So there are definitely both state and federal cost share programs out there to help, and that's what we used when we did our glade restoration. Now, Dan chose to do the work himself, but he got paid to do that. He got, we got cost share for him to go out there and cut cedars and for us to go and burn. If we couldn't have done it ourselves, we could have used that cost share to hire a contractor to do it for us. And as Susan said, the even though the private land conservationists work for the Missouri Department of Conservation, which is a state agency, they will also have information about any, any federal cost share programs right. that you might be able to enroll in as well. And I'll also mention on our Grow Native website, if you go to the resource guide, um, we there are a number of uh, native, Grow Native professionals who are some of the contractors that Susan mentioned, if you would like to hire someone you know, with or without cost share. Um, Susan, if you have time, we do have a few more questions. Um, th there, uh, Dwayne asks. So, if you're if you if you're restoring a glade, maybe you, you've burned cedar. Um, will you need to plant native plants, or will they automatically appear? Well, that's a good question, and hopefully they automatically appear. And I would not 
I would not suggest anybody plant anything out there until they see whether things appear. But also choose your site carefully. If you have a glade, you know, try to see if anything's still out there. Um, but that is easier said than done. You know, it's you need to know your plants pretty well to be able to recognize them in their struggling stage in the in the shade. But um, or open up a little bit of it and see what starts to come out. But it's amazing how much is still out there. Um, so I would say I would do the restoration first and watch what comes if it's if you're in an urban near or close to an urban area or suburban area where there's a lot of competition from exotics, that could be a different issue. You might have what might come in is a whole bunch of Ceresia and you know autumn olive and God knows what else, um, spotted knapweed, and that that would be a whole different ballywick that you'd have to deal with. But I would, as far as planting native plant seeds, I would wait until you see what comes. And then after a few years, and I would give it three to five years before I would then consider uh, supplementing if it wasn't giving me what I wanted to see. Because how do you know if it was nat native to the site unless you give it the chance to appear on its own? Thanks, Susan. And something I think it, that's interesting to point out is some of those early colonizer plants which can sometimes alarm people uh, in both a prairie planting or, or a glade restoration. And um, some of those early colonizers, if, as long as they're native, could be short-lived. And while they might be abundant, um, they are really important for you know, ho holding the soil. Um, Absolutely. Could, you, could you speak a little bit about um, you know, maybe some early colonizers that people will see. And when I say colonizers, I mean plants that are going to kind of rapidly spring up in a kind of a bare area. I don't know if that's how you would no. describe that. But if you could talk a little bit, just in case people are, have some concerns about right. seeing, you know, one dominant plant. Right. Well, luckily, one of the colonizers is really pretty and nobody gets alarmed by it, which is that beautiful rose verbena. And you see a lot more of that in the early stages of a glade restoration than you do once it becomes more established. It doesn't handle competition well. Um, so, but the other ones that people do get more alarmed by, you know, um, horsetails, otherwise known as mare's tail, uh, caniza, which, you know, is a nightmare to the agricultural world. It's a normal part of restoration, whether it be a prairie planting or whether it be, you know, you've just cleared some cedars off of your glade, or you've got a burn pit more likely where the burn pile is, you're going to see ragweed and horseweed and other things like that come in. And that's fine. They're just, they're temporary. There's even a few exotics that are reasonably temporary. And one of those is um, um, mullen, common mullen, the camper's best friend, they call it with the big fuzzy leaves and the tall yellow spires of flowers. That one is exotic and it tends to invade disturbed areas and move into a glade restoration uh, early in the process. And my husband would go after some of them and I always was of the, of the frame of mind that they, they kind of peter out on their own once everything gets going. They're biennial, um, they, they, they need bare ground to get established and they did indeed peter out in time. Uh, but if they were really overabundant, I'd probably spray some of those. But, um, but the, the native, Ruderal species that move in briefly um, will be outcompeted by the better stuff as it gets going. So, yeah, just sit back and enjoy. Just watch for the exotics. Thank you. Ben asks Have you ever seen a, a glade species that was completely wiped out from a glade by severe drought? Hmm. Well, I mean, that would require knowing the glade really well and knowing what species was there before and seeing it disappear completely. And that's never happened in my, that I've seen. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I, I haven't seen it happen. Um, I have seen tree species die on glades during droughts. And that's pretty normal, I would think. You know, I've seen cedars, I've seen um, um, uh, farkleberry um, and other like blueberry species on igneous glades. Um, and other woody species that in very bad drought years, they literally just die on the glades. And that's that I think would just be part of the natural process. And that that's one of the things that helps to keep a glade more open. 
Um, but I haven't personally noticed any herbaceous species disappearing because of drought. Thank you. There are a few questions about prairies and glades. And, I, and also, does the Prairie Foundation own any glades? Um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation now owns 30 properties, and they're all original prairies, or some are planted prairies, but mostly original. Um, we don't own any, any properties that are only glade, but we do own uh, Schwartz Prairie, which contains a glade. And as Susan was saying, glades are more, more often found in association with woodlands but they can be found in association with prairie. So Schwartz Prairie contains uh, some sandstone outcrops and some glade, glade plants. And there are some glade-like qualities to our Lapati Gem Prairie um, and our uh, Shooty Prairie, which is near Bolivar. And um, this past summer, we acquired Rock Hill Prairie, which was previously owned by the Nature Conservancy, and the Nature Conservancy donated it to us. And that's a very glade-like prairie. There was also a question, are sand prairies the same as glades? And the answer is no. Uh, sand prairies are a very distinct kind of prairie uh, in Missouri found uh, in association with the Mississippi River. And we the Prairie Foundation does own a sand prairie in Scott County near the boot heel. And that's, um, it might may have some plants that you might find on glades as well. Well, it does like cori like coriapsis, but they're pretty unique in their, and in, in quite, quite a bit different. Um, so I hope that clears up the questions about that. And there was a, a, one other question about, um, agencies using prescribed fire. And I think you, does the Forest Service use prescribed fire? Does the National Park Service, Conservation Department? I think you uh, answered that yes, they do, but but they don't all have, you know, uh, unlimited personnel to do maybe as many as, as uh, are needed. Could you comment on that, Susan? Sure, um, yeah, I'd like to see us burning a whole lot more than we are, but we are doing Burning as much as we can, and um, definitely glades are one of the things that are a high priority for us. If we have a high quality glade, that's that becomes a priority to try to keep that in fire management. Um, woodlands, we have you know thousands and thousands of acres of, and we'd love to see more of them in fire management, but that's not realistic. But where we don't have thousands and thousands of acres of, of, of glade everywhere. So where we do have them, we are trying to get fire on the ground. Thank and yes, you. Yes, all, all of those agencies are using fire, yes. Thank you, Susan. I'm afraid we're, um, we're out of time now, but thank you ev everyone very much for your very insightful questions and your interest. And huge thank you to you, Susan. There's uh, tons of kudos to you for your beautiful slides and expertise and and, uh, very well thought out and presented uh, talk. So thank you very much, uh, Susan. And for all of you who tuned in, yes, a, a, rec a link to a recording of Susan's presentation will be available, will be emailed to you tomorrow along with a number of the resources that were discussed today. Um, we have another um, uh, webinar that may be of a special interest to landowners on um, Forest and Woodland Health with uh, Robbie Deerhoff. That's on um, January 19. And we also next week are offering some free prairie hands-on training at our Shooty Prairie. And we do have some openings left. Um, we do have, uh, you can go to our uh, website, excuse me, not our website, but if you look on social media and if you got our e-news, you will find information about that. And um, if we haven't filled up by tomorrow, we can send information about that in the email uh, tomorrow. So thanks, everyone. And uh, oh, it, it is on the website. Excuse me. The information about the training is on the website. Excuse me. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night and I hope to see you back uh, for another webinar coming up. Thanks again, Susan. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.